This morning, we're back in Matthew 13. And before we get started, I'm curious, can you tell if someone is a Christian? Can you tell if somebody is a Christian? How can you tell if somebody is a Christian? Or maybe a different question, should you even be trying to make that determination? Should you even be trying to decide if somebody is a Christian? These are actually pretty controversial questions. I spent a lot of time with one of my very close friends talking about baptism and how the church does that and whether or not these questions matter, whether or not we're supposed to even try to determine if somebody's Christian or not. He grew up in the old Baptist tradition where if you made a profession of faith, you walked the aisle, we dunked you, and and you were Christian. And that was all of the vetting that we tried to do. And I was challenging him to say, maybe we ought to be doing a little bit more than that. And he was upset by this idea that we would, we would judge others. Because after all, my faith is personal. It's me and Jesus, right? That's how I became Christian, was by myself. And therefore, my Christian life is, is just as individual, just as private. And it runs very hard across our American values of privacy and individualism, right? We have our bat cave culture. I drive home, I raise my garage door. In theory, if my garage wasn't full of stuff, I could pull my car into my garage, close the garage door behind me, and would never have to interact with anybody that I didn't want to. This is sort of the culture that we've created, right? This rugged individualism that American culture has created. Though we might bristle at the idea of judging anyone else's salvation, I believe that's actually Christ's purpose in telling us today's parable was to make it clear that it is possible for us to determine whether or not a person is saved, whether or not a person has genuinely received the message of the gospel. Not only is it possible to make that determination, it's not nearly as complicated as we would like to make it. So as we said last week, the parable begins in Matthew 13, really it begins in verse 3, verses 1 and 2 are sort of the introduction. Verse 3, the parable that Faye read a moment ago says, And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and birds came and devoured them. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seed fell on good soil and produced grain, some one hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Let me pray for us for just a moment. Father God, we are so thankful for you, Lord, for you being a God who has brought us this message, Lord, for you being a God who wants us to know that we can understand whether or not someone is saved, Lord, that it's not as complicated as we would like to make it. Father, I pray this morning for this message, for my words, and for the opportunity to share with this congregation, Lord, what you would have me share. I pray that as always you would take me out of the way, Lord, and make these words yours, that we might better understand the scriptures and grow closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. What must the disciples have been thinking when Christ began with this parable? So he's in a boat, crowds are listening, he's been preaching about the kingdom, he's been confronting the Pharisees, he's been kind of going at this pretty hard. And this crowd has gathered... And he starts talking to the crowd about agriculture. Have you ever been in a car when the radio station changes accidentally? And you're listening to some music and suddenly it's talk radio, or you're listening to talk radio and suddenly you're listening to music and you're like, what what happened? I feel like maybe something broke here. The disciples, I have to imagine, have been sitting there listening to Jesus going, what did he just say? Is he talking about soil and seeds? The rest of the parables in this chapter, most of them begin with a formula. It says the kingdom of heaven is like, right? This idea that parable is an extended simile or metaphor, but this first parable, right out of the gates, has no such introduction. All of a sudden, we're just talking about seed being sown. And I have to imagine the disciples were a little bit confused about what it was that was happening. Now, Israel was an agricultural society, so farming and and herding of sheep, and these analogies are commonplace to the New Testament, because they would have been memorable for the people. They would have been relatable for the people. I can't get plants to grow in my front yard. 
So they're not as memorable for me. And yet they're, they're the images that Christ used because they would have been understood by those people. Now, although it would have been recognized for its content, it's unlikely that they would have understood its deeper meaning. Verse 9 is sort of the clue that the, there was more to the story than, it's originally, than it originally appeared to listeners. He said, those who have ears, let them hear. And as we talked about last week, last week, those parables are intended to be coded messages for those who are part of the kingdom, who have understood the kingdom message. Jesus is not converting to horticulturalism. He's still talking about the kingdom, even though he didn't introduce it that way. Verses 10 through 17 tell us that the parables are these extended metaphors, are these coded teachings that explain the kingdom and explain what righteousness looks like and unrighteousness looks like. But they're coded messages meant for those who have ears to hear, who have received spiritual sight and spiritual hearing, who have received a heart that can understand these messages, that can understand the messages as they're intended, not just on their face value. Though the disciples had been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, as he said in the later verses, the Spirit had not yet come upon them. That would happen later at Pentecost, after Christ's death and resurrection. The Spirit wasn't there to help them understand these truths yet, so their understanding was still obscured by the future fulfillment of God's promises in Christ and the future indwelling of the Spirit. So they come together at a later point, and they come to Jesus, and privately Jesus explains to them. And that's where we find ourselves this morning, the second half of our passage is all the way down in verse 18. Verses 18 to 23 are the explanation of this parable of the sowers that Jesus gave to his people. So we're going to talk about the parable of the sower this morning, but I don't have to interpret it for you as much because Jesus has done the work for me, which I appreciate. So let me read through verses 18 to 23 as Jesus explains the parable to his people. That's Matthew 13, verse 18 begins. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom but does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root in himself but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution rises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but cares the cares of the world and the deceitful riches, the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case one hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. I love that he begins his explanation with hear the parable hear the parable of the sower. They all heard the parable of the sower, right? That's why they were asking questions about it. But he wants them to hear. He wants them to hear as they were intended to hear, not just to hear the words, but to understand the meaning. The difference between hearing and truly hearing. Suddenly the picture has depth that it didn't originally. It's Again, it's not a farming lesson. It's something about the kingdom and what it means to believe. The word of the kingdom, the, what we might call the gospel, is the seed being spread. The soils are the hearts of those who hear the message, some hearing and some truly hearing. The growth and its fate is the faith of the hearer. The growth that comes from those seeds and the fate of that growth is the faith of the hearer. Not surprisingly, Christ's explanation is helpful and clear with a little more for me to explain beyond it, right? The path represents a hearer who doesn't understand the message of the gospel at all. Without understanding, they never arrive at any kind of faith. There's no growth. There's no movement. Their heart and their understanding remains darkened, unilluminated by the truth. And what little they have, Satan steals away from them before it can take hold. The rocky soil represents the hearer who does not count the costs We're told that before we go about faith, we are to count the cost. They don't count the cost. And when life challenges their budding beliefs, when their beliefs run against what they want their life to look like and how they want to live and the friends they want to have and their relationships, they abandon their faith. They abandon it at the first sign of resistance, the first sign of persecution, the first sign of difficulty. That growth reveals itself not to be well-rooted and it perishes. The thorny soil represents a hearer who believes, 
that faith is compatible with their current life. Ooh, this is a trap that many of us fall into. We think, yeah, this all sounds pretty good. I'm just going to tack that right alongside what I'm already doing, and I'll just take both. I believe it's compatible with the world and its ideas of success and prosperity. This thorny soil is the one unwilling to part with the idols that they've worshipped. Like Israel, they attempt to take their idols with them into the promised land. Just in case this whole God thing doesn't work out, I'm going to take those things with me so that I can always fall back on them. Believing they can continue to worship both depending on the season and what's happening. The good soil represents the hearer who receives the word and truly hears. They don't just receive the word, but they understand the word. They don't just understand the word, but they bear fruit from the word. Their faith grows into something productive. They abide in their faith. Their faith abides in them, and it yields a harvest over time. I believe this is the reason that Christ tells this parable, is so that we can know what it looks like to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, what it looks like to be saved, what it looks like to be a Christian. That's the picture that he's drawing for us. That's the fundamental center of the parable. Three of the soils are unaffected by the word. They're unchanged. One soil becomes something productive. The seed takes root, and it grows, and it bears fruit. Three of the hearts remained hard, stone, dying and dead. One of the hearts has changed into a heart of flesh, saved by faith in Christ, and alive with him. Three of the soils remain in rebellion against God, rejection of who he is and and the Jesus that he sent. One of the souls is surrendered and used for his purposes. The soils aren't really changed by the word, but their nature is exposed, and the seeds either prosper in them or die. Those in whom the seeds die cannot be called Christians. They bear no life, they bear no fruit. That faith does not grow into anything. We spent some time this morning in the youth discussing this idea that if we can't lose our salvation, then none of these people can be called Christians. Because that faith dies, it withers, it disappears. It never truly took hold. The one soil, still soil, becomes a vessel in which the seed yields a harvest, something beautiful. What a beautiful picture this is. For somebody who can't keep plants alive, I can still appreciate the beauty of this image. I can still appreciate the beauty of a farmer planting and yielding a harvest. By this parable, Christ provides for us a model by which we can discern the salvation of individuals. I believe that's what this is. This is a basic formula, right? They must have an understanding of the gospel message. They must endure right? Perseverance of the saints. They must endure in their faith through seasons of difficulty and persecution. Their life must not cling to the idols of this world, setting aside those things for the priorities that God would have for them, and they must bear fruit. This is it. This is not complicated. We, we oftentimes want to make this so much more difficult because we want to be able to put our stamp of approval And say, yes, for sure, and nothing bad is ever going to happen to this person, and I can be positive and confident that they are who they say they are. And yet, Jesus says it's very simple. Do they understand the gospel? Do they persevere through difficulty? Have they set aside the idols of this life? And are they bearing fruit as Christians? This is it. This is the whole message. Now, within this message, there are a couple of useful insights that are worth a minute or two to talk about. I'm going to come back to that point, but... Within this, I want to talk about some of the other things that this parable reveals to us about the message of the gospel and how it takes hold in us. Number one, not all who receive the gospel will be saved. I know this is probably something that we know, something that's obvious, but it's a good reminder that some soils will not bear the seed, and we are not responsible for the nature of the soil. Though God may ultimately be the sower we are still the means by which he delivers that seed. So you can call us the wind, or you can call us whatever you want. That's not what this parable is about. We have been called to deliver that message, and we have to understand that not all soils are going to receive that message. And we can mourn for them, but we mustn't take personally the fact that some soils were never going to receive the seed and go on and continue to sow as God has called us. 
Number two, we must teach the faith. Right? Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. How many of you guys have heard this, this, this quote? It's credited to a guy named Francis Assisi. He was a saint. Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. I'm here to tell you, as much as I appreciate who Francis of Assisi was, this is a terrible quote. Please don't ever quote it to anybody. And if anybody tells it to you, please stop them and say, no. If understanding is the first qualification for faith, then we must teach the gospel in words. The whole counsel of God in which it is contained. The Bible, where we find it. In a reasonable and rational way, using words. That's why we invest in the teaching of our kids and our youth. That's why we have adult Sunday school classes. That's why we have a sermon during every service, because it's our job to teach the scriptures, to teach the gospel. Because if you have to have understanding to be saved, I have to teach you what it is. If you want others to be saved in your life, you can pray for them, you can walk with them, you can do mercy ministry, you can meet their needs, you can love them, but at the end of the day, you're going to have to go to them with the message of the gospel. At some point, in words, you are going to have to testify your faith to them. You're going to have to introduce them to a God who's given himself to us in words. Romans 10, 14 says it this way. It says, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? We must preach the gospel to our children, to our neighbors, and to anyone else that will listen. Number three, not all who appear to be saved are truly saved. This is a hard one. Though some of the soil received the seed initially, it becomes clear quickly that that seed never took root. This means from time to time we're going to get it wrong. Somebody who we believed was Christian, somebody who we believed was probably saved, turns out not to be. Turns out that our initial assessment of their enthusiasm for the word, their enthusiasm for Christ was short-lived, either because they had not traded it in for what they were already worshiping, or because they were not willing to endure hardship for him. Christ tells us that we can reasonably judge whether or not a person is Christian, but also that we're going to get it wrong from time to time. Some are going to reveal the genuineness of their salvation after our initial discernment. And that's okay. We don't need to be paralyzed by the fear of error. We don't need to be paralyzed by the fear of marrying someone who might turn out not to be Christian or welcoming somebody into membership who might not be Christian. God's got that in control. We must be diligent in our encouragement of one another. We must be diligent in the holding accountable of one another to continue to follow up with one another with the gospel and say, Are you sure you're saved? Not because we doubt it, but because we want you to be sure. I want to be sure of my salvation. And that means from time to time challenging me and saying, hey, this doesn't look like the life of a believer. The difference is not whether I screw up. The difference is not whether I wander and get lost and sin and error. The question is whether or not I repent in return when I do. Number four, we must be diligent and vigilant of the thorns which surround our faith and prepared for the trials that we are sure to encounter. The difference between the saved and lost is not a matter of willpower. It's not white knuckle holding on. We are called to be diligent in our way of life. We must be relentless in our work to remove the idols from our lives as they pop up. It's like a -a whack-a-mole game. Just when you think you've cleared the board, up pops another idol that you didn't even realize existed. Something else you're willing to worship, something else you're willing to praise, something else you're willing to put your hope into. And you smack that one down. And just about the time you smack that one down, another one pops up. You've probably heard it said that maturity in Christ is not the absence of sin, it's the awareness of sin. I would like to think it's both. I'd like to think we root some sin out as we go but your ability to recognize sin in your life certainly grows as you mature in Christ. We must be relentless in the rooting out. 
This is best accomplished in the community of believers encouraging one another to a life of faith and propping one another up through seasons of drought and difficulty. If it's just about me and Jesus, then in those seasons where Jesus feels far away, I'm alone. Not alone. Jesus hasn't left me, but it feels that way. And it would be good for me to have some brothers and sisters, a Bill in my life who can come to me and say, hey, Nick, you seem like you're having a tough time right now. Why don't, we, why don't we go talk about it? Why don't we go read some scripture? A wife in my life who can come to me and say, hey, this doesn't look like the behaviors of a godly man. This community of faith is important for us to endure those struggles. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25 says it this way. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Right? That alone feels hard. That alone feels like a, a demand on me that I can't meet. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. But I, I waver, I struggle. But the writer of Hebrews wasn't done. Verses 24 25 say, And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. This idea that we can hold fast to our confession without wavering is not an individual sport. It is meant to be done in community. It is meant to be done where we encourage one another. Since about March, I've been making it to the gym most of three or four days a week, which means that in the first week of March, I went to the gym more times than for the four years before that. And part of the reason I'm going is because I have a friend who I am dragging to the gym with me who doesn't want to go either. But I will drag you to the gym. I will make you go to the gym. The day he's like, hey, I'm sick. I'm not going to make it today. Okay, I'll go without you. I'm not going without you. I'm going to stay home. I'm going to sleep too. But I will drag you to the gym. The same is true of our faith. Those days when I don't feel like it, I don't feel like it. And I'm probably not going to turn it around for me. The days when I don't feel like it, but a brother comes to me and says, man, I don't feel like it today. What do you mean you don't feel like it? We're doing it anyway. I still don't feel like it. But we're doing it together because that's what we do in community. The fifth point we'll come back to at the end is that we must as Christians bear fruit. Now, why would Christ give us this metric by which to evaluate the salvation of others? Isn't my faith my personal issue? If my faith is between me and God, then my faith is also between me and God. If my salvation is between me and God, then my faith is also between me and God, right? It's a private issue. It's none of anyone else's business. Aren't we supposed to not judge others? Doesn't the scripture tell us don't judge others? That means if I'm judging you as saved, then I might be judging you as not saved. I don't want to judge anybody as not saved. I'm not damning anybody to hell. That's not my job. So I'll do me and you do you. Live and let live, right? Slap that coexist sticker on the back of your car and just confuse everybody because none of that makes any sense. And if I can't really know if you're saved, right, the only way to truly know if somebody's saved is if they have the Holy Spirit in them. As it turns out, I can't see that. And if the only way to truly tell if somebody's saved is the Holy Spirit is in them and I can't really know for sure anyway, then why bother? Why judge them? The last thing I want to do is go nosing around anybody else's business. We, we bristle at this idea that we should try to determine the status of someone else's salvation, and we don't want to judge others. We put it in the same category as my marriage and my finances. My relationship with my spouse is my relationship with my spouse. It's none of your business. My finances are my finances. It's none of your business. And we decide that we just, we can't make a determination about anybody's salvation anyway. So that eases our discomfort with the idea that we might have to. But Christ has left us without this excuse. He's given us a means by which we can reasonably assess the status of somebody's salvation. And the idea that we don't need to make that assessment of others is just foolishness. I know it makes us uncomfortable but it's foolish to believe that we don't need to assess the salvation of others. We must discern to the best of our ability the status of others' salvation. If someone is saved, we go to them for prayer in times when we're struggling. 
We seek them out for counsel in times that we're struggling. I've walked friends through struggling marriages, and they have sought counsel from a variety of people, some of whom I know to be Christian and some of whom clearly are not. And I can tell you that the advice you receive is very, very different. We seek out counsel from those we know to be Christian. We invite them to be members of our church. We might make them a pastor or a deacon of our church. We hold them accountable to what God has called them to. We welcome them to hold us accountable for what God has called us to. We disciple them in their faith and invite them to disciple us. This is life in the body of Christ. It's a warm and reciprocal host of relationships that builds us up and grows us into Christ's likeness. You become Christian as an individual, but your Christian life is anything but individual. It is a relationship with others that builds us up together. But that only works if those people are also Christian. You, that kind of relationship, that kind of reciprocal life-giving relationship doesn't work with a dead person. So to some degree, we have to assess that. If we assess that somebody is not saved, we pray for them. Not that we don't pray for Christians, but we pray for them differently than we pray for Christians. Because we know the peril of their soul. We do not seek them out for counsel. We invite them to church so that they can hear the scriptures with us, but we don't invite them to be members of the church. We restrain them from roles of authority in our faith communities. Unfortunately, this is one of those things that we've gotten horribly wrong in, in the last few decades, not at this church in particular, but in the Christian church at large. We have invited men and women to lead who we have little evidence are Christian at all. The Bible gives us a very clear rubric for who should be pastors and deacons of your church. And I got news for you, it's not anything magical. That list really should apply to every mature Christian everywhere. And that's what we're asking of those who are pastors and deacons. Are they Christian? Are they mature? We have to be able to make that assessment. We look for opportunities to preach the gospel to them and warn them of the precarious position of their souls. If we assess somebody is not saved, we want to reach them with the gospel. We want to persist in reaching them with the gospel and praying for them. If we, assume, if we determine that somebody is unsaved, they are lost and we have been charged with reaching out to them on behalf of Christ. As Christians, we should see this as the most fundamental difference and commonality between us and, us and others in our lives. Paul in Galatians 3 says this, he says, For as many of you were baptized into Christ and have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. We cannot truly live out the Christian life in community and live out the Great Commission without discerning this fundamental difference. If we're living in light of the temporary reality of this world and the eternal reality of the next world, then we should not allow lesser distinctions to separate us or bring us together more than our genuinely held faith in Christ. Let me say that again. If we're living in light of the temporary realities of this world and the eternal realities of the next world, then we should not allow lesser distinctions to separate us or bring us together more than our genuinely held beliefs about Jesus Christ. Whether or not you are Christian should mean more to me in our relationship than whether you are a Republican or a Democrat. Whether you are a male or a female. Whether you are white or Hispanic or black or fill in the blank. Whether you are a salesman or an executive or a doctor or a mechanic, what you do for a living. Whether you have a doctorate or you didn't graduate high school. These things should all matter far less to me than whether or not you are a brother or sister in Christ or somebody I should be reaching with the gospel. That should be the first way I identify you. Furthermore, we must be able to make this distinction for the sake of our own souls. This rubric of whether or not someone else is Christian is not just that. This is a rubric of whether or not the faith of a person is genuine. 
I got news for you. You're one of those A people. This is a rubric to help you determine whether or not your faith is genuine. To challenge you to ask, do I understand the gospel? Am I prepared to endure hardship in the name of Christ? What truly possesses my heart? And am I bearing fruit? This is essentially what I tell people when they ask what they should say during their profession of faith, their testimony before the church. They, they're like, well, I, I, don't know what I, should, I don't know what I should say. How much, how much detail do I have to go into? And my answer to them is pretty basic. What is the gospel as you understand it? Can you articulate the gospel? How has it changed your life? Are you committed to following Christ no matter what comes? And how has this faith borne fruit in your life? If you can come up here and say those four things, that, brothers and sisters, that's a profession of faith. Yeah, your story might be dramatic. It might be from the throes of prison to, you know, the heights of who knows. You might have been a rich person who, you know, sold everything you had to serve Jesus. It might be dramatic. But at the end of the day, whether or not you're a Christian doesn't come down to what you sold or what you have or what you don't have. It comes down to those four things. Do I understand the gospel? How has my life changed? Am I committed to following Christ no matter what comes? And has my life borne fruit? If you're here this morning and you don't understand the gospel of Jesus Christ and what it requires of you, if you don't think these four things apply to you, I would love the opportunity to share more with you about what the scriptures tell us, about what Christ did so that you can be saved. What your life might look like if you could answer those four questions. If you're here this morning and you don't know the answer to those questions, come and find me. Come and find Max. Tap someone around you and say, hey, who's been a member of this church a while that could answer these questions for me? We would love to share with you the truth of the gospel. And we would love for you to know the peril of your soul in this moment apart from him. If you don't believe you are one of those Christians, we would love to share with you what that looks like. We would love to be part of the sowing of seed in your life. For those of you who understand the gospel and have professed faith, if you can't answer each of these questions confidently, then come and seek out a brother or sister to pray for God's grace and growth in these areas. We're going to experience seasons of spiritual drought. The only problem is if we're satisfied in that season, if we're harboring sin and clinging to it. We should be seeking God through the regular means of grace until he restores our withered soul. Regular means of grace look like showing up to church. They look like praying together. They look like reading your Bible together, observing communion, doing those things that remind us of the truth of the scriptures and how they play out in our lives. Though we may backslide, we mustn't wallow in sin and remain. If you have surrendered to sin, if you have welcomed thorns to take residence and choke out your faith, even if those thorns were originally good things, fitness, financial stewardship, family, relationships, you may find that your faith was never genuine and eternal separation from God and hell awaits you at the end of this life. It is not the presence of sin, but the acceptance of it that indicates a lack of true faith. As we'll read in a few minutes prior to the Lord's Supper, repentance is powerful enough to overcome any sin. And any sin is powerful enough to overcome a lack of repentance. If we are truly Christ's, then we will repent of those sins and seek after him. The last lesson from this is, are we bearing fruit? What does the parable say about bearing fruit? What does it mean to bear fruit? That's one of the youth asked this morning. First, the parable tells us that we must be bearing fruit, right? The, the fundamental difference between two of those soils is one bore fruit and another didn't. The growth in one soil amounted to nothing. The growth in another soil amounted to something productive for God. And it's one of the fundamental differences between somebody who is and is not Christian. That's why when you come to us and profess faith, one of the things we look for is how your life is bearing fruit before we welcome you in. Not because we're being judgmental or because we're being legalistic, but because the scriptures tell us that Christians will necessarily bear fruit. So therefore, we should be able to see fruit born of faith in your life. Second, it tells us that not all of us who bear fruit will bear the same fruit, right? Though we all may be genuine in our faith, the fruit we bear will look different in quantity and quality and kind. 
We should not judge others as greater or lesser than us just because the fruit that they bear looks different than ours. Scripture tells us the Spirit gives gifts according to the grace that was given to us in Romans 12, 6. Right? The grace of what was given to us. Not, not what we deserve, not what we've earned, not commensurate with our service. We're given gifts according to that grace, and that, those gifts bear fruit. 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that each of our gifts and the fruit that we bear by them are valuable and necessary to the gathered body of Christ, to work together. So what might this fruit look like? Well, the parable doesn't tell us. The parable doesn't tell us what the fruit looks like. Fortunately, we have many other places in Scripture that will tell us what that fruit looks like. Matthew 3.8 says we're told to bear fruit in keeping with repentance, right? Just what we've already been talking about. Christianity is not an absence of sin in our life. It is the presence of repentance, of constant and ongoing repentance. We're told that the fruit of the Spirit is what bearing fruit looks like, right? Ryan could come sing the song for us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Not just that we possess those things, but that we possess those things in increasing measure. That God is growing those things within us, and they're coming out of us in a way that they probably wouldn't be apart from the Spirit. Especially in areas where we previously struggled. I can tell you that self-control is one of those areas for me. Any self-control that I display now, any grown-up maturity that you see from me now, I assure you is entirely the work of God. Because that is not an area where I am naturally gifted. That's an area where Christ came into my life and fixed some of what is broken. There's still plenty left, don't worry. We are called as disciples to go, therefore, and make disciples, reaping a new harvest that will in turn yield a new harvest, that will in turn yield a new harvest. This is the nature of agriculture, right? You, you pick up the crops, and you set aside enough of the grain so that next season you can go back and do what? You can plant more crops. If you don't plant or you don't save the seed, you don't have more crops the next year. So it's this idea that we are called to bear fruit for Christ. Some of that fruit is repentance. Some of that fruit is growth in Christ-likeness. Some of that fruit is the spreading of God's word as we have been called to deliver that seed to others. And not just to make disciples, but to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them to observe all that I have commanded. And one of those commands is to go and make disciples. Disciples are disciple makers. The disciples that we make must also be disciple makers. This is what we've been called to. This is how we know if we are Christian. If you are satisfied in your faith as a private thing that you do by yourself, apart from anybody else, I'm fearful for you. that Your faith is something that will wither when pressure comes. If you want to see your faith grown, if you want to see fruit born, if you want to care for others, if you want to be a part of the body of faith, that's what you are called to as Christians. So yes, we must discern whether others are saved, so we know how to regard them, again, as a brother and sister or as someone to whom we need to take the gospel. We need to know if we are Christian so that we can have confidence that we are saved in Christ and we can live with boldness knowing that the worst thing anybody here can do is kill us and that we are held secure in him you need to be able to discern whether or not you are Christian. And Jesus gives us a wonderful recipe for that. John 10, 27 through 30, another verse we read this morning with the youth. It says, My sheep hear my voice. This is our assurance of pardon this morning. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the Jesus that we serve. This is the Jesus that we love. We can't possibly be taken from his hand. We've been given to him, and we will remain his if we understand the gospel, if we endure seasons of difficulty, if we have traded in this life for Christ, and if we bear fruit as evidence of the Spirit living in us, let me pray for us.